the Tie Cats Audio Network. This is the CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. No upsets were pulled in the CFL Division semifinals, but we'll ask you, did you enjoy your postseason games on Saturday? In the words of a classic comedian, does Vernon Adams Jr. get no respect? On that note, when the Lions battle the Bombers in the West Final, will they be entering the league's most hostile environment? Welcome to the CFL This Week on the Ticats Audio Network. I'm Bubba O'Neill. Thank you, as always, for checking out the number one podcast for CFL information and opinion with the guests who are certainly in the know. On the program this week, he's one of my colleagues at the Ticats Audio Network. When he's one of the broadcasters and He's also, you know, I guess in his day, probably one of the best and most reliable receivers, especially on second down. Luke Tasker, always a pleasure. Hey, thanks, Bubba. Looking forward to it. Hey, very quietly, he's certainly expanded his role from being one of the top CFL analysts in this country to one of the guys that's across the border doing a lot of work with the National Football League. And we certainly appreciate what he's been doing as well, too. David Naylor from TSN, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, well, it's been a long time since we've seen this fella. He does a lot of CFO work for Sportsnet and writes and reports for those Argos. David Morissuti, pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be back. I'll appreciate you all, folks. Let's talk some football. CFL Saturday playoff format. Let's see. David Naylor, did you like it? What were the reviews like? Yeah, I was fine with the Saturdays. I, I know that like, I remember when they tried this about 10 years ago. And, you know, it only lasted one year because there's kind of an expression in, in the newspaper business, don't move the comics. And, you know, what I, that's what I mean, just it's, it speaks to the nature of habit viewing. And I, I don't know, for some reason, I found this a lot less jarring than I did when they tried this about a decade ago. I, I think there's more of a commitment that even if they do see some dip in the ratings that they want to sort of see this through more as a one year experiment. And, and look, this is pretty strictly now a Friday, Saturday league after Labor Day, right? And and in the summer, it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday league. But, um, I'm sorry, Thursday, Sunday league. But but it's, I mean, Saturday is the day that whether you're talking about before Labor Day or after Labor Day, there's always CFL football. So I, I'm, I'm quite fine with the Saturday games. I, I was, I, other than, you know, missing some good college football games that I was bouncing back and forth with. But, hey, you're always going to have a conflict of some kind. But I, I really like this. Mr. Mursuti, your thought on Saturday football? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously different. You're always, uh, especially for the playoffs, I'm always accustomed to the Sunday kickoffs, but I actually liked it, you know? I think Saturdays are also a better time for different people to get to the football field, right? Families generally prefer to do things like that on a Saturday. So I, I actually didn't mind it. I think, you know, and you're also not going up against the people down south and though in those games too so i think it doesn't hurt to try something and and stick with it for a little bit see if it makes that change that the cfl is looking for well luke we were working obviously during the game last weekend but uh you, your, your thoughts on just the approach of, of playing on saturdays yeah uh i i enjoy the saturday uh games i do like to avoid uh, the NFL conflicts uh, when we're, uh, you know, for fans and, and viewers, it also extends the, the one more day in a, in a, in a week of prep as you move closer to a Sunday gray cup uh, is an advantage for players in general too. Uh, that has to travel through the, through the finals weekend, but uh, sort of just extending that, that, uh, that two week stretch by a day um, I think is, uh, is helpful for the players. And uh, I think a Saturday is an enjoyable uh, day for the fans. And I, and I guess as, as a former player as well, too, because this league kind of plays on a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday, you, players would probably be pretty, pretty flexible to playing on Saturday. Yeah, you, you get so used to it during the season. We have our Labor Day Classic, of course. I think the only day I actually never played a game was a Tuesday. I, I think I, I'm pretty sure at some point in there there was a Wednesday mixed in, and I can't remember how that worked with bye weeks and schedules or which week you were playing in, like the previous last game of the previous week or the first game of the next week. I don't even remember, but uh, you get used to it as a player, and a Saturday is is pretty much uh, straight down the fairway. You know, If it's a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, it feels somewhat normal for you. Dave, was this a TSN initiative or something that collaborative with, with, with the Canadian Football League? I think it was, and again, I'll be very clear, I don't speak for TSN on matters like this, but but I believe it was sort of collaborative that uh, obviously it, 
Bell Media being CTV, TSN, owns all the content in the, for the National Football League in this country as well. So uh, just you could see why, and I'm just theorizing here, that from a business perspective, if we own all the content of the CFL property and we own all the content of the National Football League, that there might be some desire to not run those two properties head to head. And so, you know, I, I think it sort of, but I actually, I talked to the commissioner about this this week, actually, and there was definitely a, you know, a strong impulse for the league to just try to kind of, as I said earlier, you know, really lean into that idea that we are the Friday, Saturday league after Labor Day and, and that with the playoffs keeps it consistent. But, but I think it, it made, it certainly made sense. Uh, from a TSN perspective as well. But again, I'll, I'll be clear, I'm not invited into the boardroom for those conversations. <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough, fair enough, though. But I, I, I will appreciate the fact there, uh, guys, is that, is, is that TSN actually, I, they were promoting it. Like they were letting people know our games, you know, the CFL games are on Wait. The, you know, on yeah, Saturday. There, there was a big push on that, Bob. I think that was conscious, right? Because they were trying to avoid what happened 10 years ago, you know, where people, that, that awareness didn't seem to be where it needed to be. So mm -hmm. I noticed that as well, like all over social media, all on our ads, Saturday games. You know, you, you, people, as I have, someone said, once said to me about sports, if people know your game is on, there's no guarantee that they'll come to it or watch it on TV. But if they don't know it's on, they're not coming. <laughs> they're not watching. So <laughs> the simplest rule of marketing football. And, or and well, for sure, David Morissuti, that, that's sort of the problem. I and mean, not to knock the league, but the, the, there has been seemingly a disconnect, I think, with their fans and, and the actual sport and running of the sport and scheduling of the sport. Yeah, I mean, like we've had, you know, times where you're trying to figure out what's the prime date for a CFL game. Is it Thursday? Is it Friday? Is it Saturday? Right. It's it's kind of that whole idea there. And as Dave said, you know, 10 years since they even considered doing this on a Saturday. Right. Like it was never I, I'm surprised it was never thought about doing this earlier, considering how much more the NFL has become such a prominent thing, you know, across the globe, especially here in Canada, that they never really thought, you know what, let's let's give Saturday that that real try. But, you know, and fans have, have also long talked about getting games earlier in the day too, right? Those are sort of the things there, right? It's not just the day the games are on, but the time. If you're going to have a game on the weekend, why make your fans wait until 7 o'clock sometimes for a game, right? You should be getting these games earlier because you're trying to grow also a younger audience, and the younger audience, they're not staying up until, you know, 8, 9, 10 o'clock on a Saturday sometimes to watch watch these football games. Interesting to note. Your, your uh, thought on that there, Luke? Yeah, the uh, I, I did enjoy our 3 p.m. Uh, kickoff in Montreal. I actually think it's a great time of day, uh, at least in the Eastern time zone, to, to, to start that and uh, and make it sort of a midday event. And like I said, I just think the Saturday works well for, for the, the playoff schedule. And, uh, and the, the hardest part of this coming weekend on the finals is you've got is the turnaround when for the teams that win to then go get ready for uh, the whole week of the Grey Cup, which flies by. And so um, I just take it from a player's perspective, the more, the more another, another 24 hours that you add into a, to a uh, playoff week, whether it's from semi to finals or into the Grey Cup week is a, is a help. Luke, Bobby, just, to, just, sure. just to chime on something you said, Bubba, about CFL scheduling kind of always being an issue that when we hear the commissioner talk about wanting a 10th team, that's a big, big reason why. Like, get rid of every team having to have three bye weeks. And like Luke said, where you're playing on short weeks, long weeks, all that kind of stuff. That's, you know, a lot of people say, well, why expansion? Why 10 teams? There's all kinds of reasons. But that one is high, high on the league's list because scheduling is important. Well, I'll always say this, you know, that what I think personally upset me as a, as a CFL broadcaster, a CFL fan, is that people in Hamilton – never had the opportunity to see Nathan Rourke play a game. It was only one year, but he grew up in Oakville, never got to play a game in Hamilton last year. Even what the possibility of if Bo Levi Mitchell was healthy this year, the fact that there would be no comeback game between the Tiger Cats in Calgary. And to me, that's a big mistake. That's a big miss. No question. But speaking of Rourke, if people from Hamilton want to see his little brother, he's playing tonight in Buffalo. But I'll just try to chime in on that since he's so close to Oakville. There you go. 
he's pretty good too. I hear a lot of people saying that he might even be better. I mean, we don't know about that, but, but certainly uh, the size of the kid and the big gun on the guy, well, he's, he's certainly a, quite a prospect. Look, let me come to you on this one here, only because I, I think you played with him at least for a training camp. Uh, and, and while talking about quarterback Vernon Adams Jr., Lions receiver Keon Hatcher said that people have been sleeping on him all year long. Do you agree? You've seen him, as I said, close up, and you continue to see him right now as he certainly has progressed throughout his career. Yeah, uh, part of that, part of the reason that he gets maybe overlooked a little bit um, is just because he's bounced around. I mean, his his uh, time in Hamilton was very short lived, uh, injury and training camp, and uh, you know you could kind of tell he was a guy who was serious about the game, who who had tons of of natural ability, but you know had trouble had trouble sticking places. And uh, you know it's funny that yes, with Nathan Rourke, he went out to BC, and it was sort of seemed like oh, just another place he's going to get tossed around in, and who knows how it's going to go. And now uh, a season and a half later, uh, it's he's kind of coming to his own. And I, I am I, I'm pretty impressed by VA this year because I think he is sort of shrugging off the idea that maybe he, uh, you know, isn't isn't quite going to be a franchise guy. And this season is is put that uh, sort of to rest. Also, I think you're gonna. He's a guy who's just can't, can't help but get overlooked by Zach Caleros uh, in the West. Um, and Chad Kelly, uh, like sort of across the league, he, you know, he's just not sitting right at the top of that, of that, uh, quarterback conversation in a few different ways, but, but his play certainly is. And, you know, I think we're going to talk about the, the BC Calgary, uh, game here shortly, but his stats from the BC Calgary game and the, and the plays that he made and the throws that he made downfield, they speak for themselves. I mean, he's playing at, at, at the absolute top, top of the whole league right now. David Morissuti, we've always said it. We've said it on this podcast a hundred times. Good VA, bad VA. Has he eliminated that? Well, he did in that one game. I'm just thinking, you know, this was this was such a you know momentous uh, win for him, right? This is one he's probably been waiting for 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 so long since he made that first start in the playoffs with Montreal and just getting back there. The journey to get back to this point for him. I think, you know, we saw it this year, right? We did see it in the, you know, where he was, you know, in that conversation among the elite quarterbacks in the league, and he's still there, right? Um, Calgary, we know that they're not of the same caliber of teams like Toronto, like Winnipeg. So I think he's there. Now it's a matter of can he replicate this against the team, against the, you know, a, a more formidable opponent than Calgary. Mr. Naylor? Uh, and let's go back to that game at Toronto. And I, I, I'm trying to correct. Did he throw six interceptions? Am I right about that in the game? Yeah, okay. I, I didn't want to say that without asking you guys because I'm like, <laughs> was it really six? Yeah. It was one of the weirdest football games I've ever seen of a quarterback because normally you say if a guy threw six picks that he had a horrible day. Look at his stat line without those six picks. <laughs> it's phenomenal, right? It, 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 it doesn't – usually you'd see, you know, he was uh, – you know, 11 for 26 for 142 yards and six picks. No, <laughs> it was, I, I've never seen a stat line by that, like that in a court. I'm not that I've seen many six pick games, but you know the point I'm making. So he's capable even within the same game as being great and not so great. And he has definitely sort of almost taken the mantle of, you know, good, bad from Henry Burris that, you know, he used to be painted with that for so many years, good Hank, bad Hank. And, and now that seems to be on Vernon. And, you know, as to your original question, has he, outgrown that or outlived that ask me in two weeks you know and and I'll, I'll start it i'll start it with this game i mean that's he's going into a hostile environment that's a tough place to play those fans are going to be jacked thirty-three thousand of them and uh let's see how let's see which va shows up there i you know if he shows like if he plays like he did in the first half of last week the rest of the way the Lions going to win the great cup i mean i, I mean it's unstoppable the way he was playing but it's again different team uh, different atmosphere and and certainly just a different level of pressure. So uh, you know, not to not to not to say that I, I don't believe he can do it, but let's see him do it. Luke, what is it like technically? What do you see in his game that that's that's improved? Well, they they are they are pulling the ball down on their deep shots downfield. Like they're just they're making it happen, moving it down in big chunks. It's interesting, Dave. What you said about just the hot and cold within one game. To, on the opposite end of the spectrum to me is the quarterback still in the playoffs, Cody Fajardo, 
who he, you're gonna, you're getting a good consistent quarterback play that is not the cold and the hot that is not the you know 400 yards uh in one game four interceptions the next game you're getting you're getting consistency in Montreal at the quarterback position that may not be good enough and my my thought is that probably not good enough to do uh to do any damage to Toronto I would say but that that kind of quarterback play has carried Montreal into and beyond uh, their first playoff win uh Vernon Adams though the 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 good the electric Vernon Adams the 70% completions 70% second downs 70% touchdowns in the red zone like you, you uh, you're right Dave you just that's that's going to win a gray cup if to 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 make to play that 3 weeks in a row uh of course you got a Winnipeg Blue Bomber defense that you're going to to play in Winnipeg and that that's going to uh, you can't get out get through four quarters without them winning a few of those plays you know David Morissuti, the funny thing is you take a look at the what he's got in terms of around him and some would argue that he has the best receivers in the league around him but not much of a running game which sometimes can expose a quarterback yeah i mean that's that's generally you see why winnipeg has been so you know they take their offense at such a high level right you go from Andrew harris to brady olivera Zach claros is able to be play at that mop level cuz he's not asked to do everything and I think with Vernon Adams, that was kind of the air, you know, one of the issues that we saw, you know, when he's trying to do too much himself, it can, he gets himself into trouble or he's throwing those interceptions. He's making those poor decisions, but he's got so many weapons that it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. He doesn't have a running game, but he's also running it himself. That's actually the Vernon Adams I want to see a little bit more of the one that's willing to take those chances and, you know, extend the plays with his legs or even just go off on himself, right? Seeing those uh, three touchdowns on the ground for himself, like that's what makes Vernon Adams that quarterback, and I think that's what BC was hoping to get when they traded for him. You know, when you mentioned the the lack of run game in BC, especially compared to, to Winnipeg, I think that's why it's really key for the Lions not to fall behind in this game because if Winnipeg gets behind, they, they can engineer a two-dimensional offense comeback. They can do it. They don't have to abandon the run if they get down 10. But I'm not sure BC can. And, you know, then again, the, the, the nature of the defense that you're facing when they know you got to throw it and you, you really don't have the option to do that. So I, if I was making a list of keys for the BC Lions in this game, don't get behind early because I think a comeback is going to be really tough for them if they do. And that's, that's the thing about Winnipeg and Toronto. Because of their run games, once they do get ahead – they can just run the ball. They can, they can yeah. just control the clock so well that you just don't get enough chances to come back on them. Even if you, even if you can pass, even if you can move the ball down the field, those Winnipeg and, Mont- and Toronto specifically will end the game just because of their ability to run the ball. Yeah, and if you, and if you stack the box on them, they can throw it. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's like pick your poison yeah. in, in that yeah. case. Yeah, you know, Dave, you kind of hinted at it there, uh, Naylor, in the sense that. VA will be going into this hostile environment. So I'll open up the discussion right there. And, and we can in, include the teams that are not in the postseason as, season as well, too. Luke, Luke, what is the most difficult stadium to go into as a visiting team? Hmm. Uh, well, when they're playing good, at the Mosaic's always been an amazing, amazingly hard place to play when, when Sask is, is, uh, has been able to uh, move the ball efficiently in, in, in the years where they had good defense. Uh, Mosaic, in my own mind, has some some uh, significance for my own career as a difficult place to play. But Winnipeg is tough too, and now especially in sort of the midst of of uh, sort of a dynasty that that they've had, uh, Winnipeg is very hard. Um, I actually like playing in BC. Uh, you just because of the 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 stadium that just the dome, it can get loud for sure, uh, and there's some of that in BC. But to me, the the answer to this question uh, lands in the in the in the plains here with with Winnipeg and of course um, uh, even Calgary uh, at times as well. But uh, Winnipeg right now, I think, is has sort of has a has a handle on their home field advantage. David Morissuti, it sounds like the the, the fans at IG um, are the, they're the most hostile, they're the most toughest. They they've certainly been the most proud, and the, the team has given them an opportunity because they've been so good over the years. Yeah, I mean they're they're certainly I mean they're the top team now in the city, right? Like that's they're a Blue Bombers town, right? So I do think that you know the the home crowd like this is why teams push for that one seed. 
it's not just to get that bye week. You want that home crowd behind you, right? You want to make take every advantage you can get when you're in the playoffs. So like and that's that's been now the MO for Winnipeg the last few years. You get that first round first round bye, you get yourself that easier path to the Grey Cup and the elements too, right? It's a little bit different playing outdoors, right, in Winnipeg than, you know, playing in an indoor stadium in B C. It's a whole different environment that you have to you have to work around. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this question from a TV perspective because I guess I'm a TV guy now. But uh, and I'm going to say Winnipeg just because I think the best-looking game that we put on television every year is the Banjo Bowl. Like the, the configuration of that stadium with every seat full and the energy that's in that stadium for that game, it, you know, the optics of it look like a major college game or you know, an NFL stadium where you don't see empty corners or upper edges. It just – it really just translates on television. It'll be the same this weekend for with the energy for that playoff game. But I'm going to throw a I'm going to throw a outside the box idea here, okay? In terms of tough places to play, maybe Toronto. And the reason I say maybe is we've never get we've never seen BMO like it's going to be this weekend. I mean, the Argos just on Tuesday morning announced they've hit twenty three thousand. I think there's a reasonable prospect they could sell this game out. Which, you know, given that half the fans aren't going to have black and gold on, is actually saying something about this market for once. And, and I can't tell you it's going to be an extremely tough place to play with 23, 25, 26,000 people in it. But we don't know. We've never seen it before. <laughs> uh, I will say this. You know, they make it raucous with 15. I mean, when you go to an R game, particularly this season, you know, there's been lots to cheer about and lots to get behind. Uh, I've sat in the stands a couple of times, once in the end zone, once on the sidelines, and, and it wasn't lacking for atmosphere. So I think, you know, it's maybe a rare occasion where we're remarking about the great atmosphere at BMO Field for a CFL game and how tough a place it may be to play this weekend. Well, it's what we've wanted for that team for so long. And I, but I think there is a parallel there, David Naylor and David Morissuti. I know you go to these games. These, those Toronto uh, the TFC games – like the, it's it's insane. It's an insane atmosphere. And if the Argos can find a way to duplicate that with the sort of fandom and everyone wearing jerseys, yeah, you're right, David Naylor. That could be a real tough place to play. Like I I've been to I mean my fair share of TFC games in that stadium when it's when it's packed. Like it's it's def it can be very deafening in that stadium when it gets very loud. I mean the, it all they've also got the metal benches so. Fans stomping, add that extra noise to it that you know might be annoying for some to listen to, but it's it, it gets it going. Like even with the with the crowd at thirteen, fourteen thousand, it's still a really ruckus crowd, you know. And I, I can only imagine what that's gonna be like when you're almost close to double that capacity. And as Dave said, like it's gonna be mostly Argos fans because you're not gonna get that Hamilton invasion that we usually see. So like it, it's going to be something to see. You know, a lot more filled, especially on the other side of the stadium. We talked a lot about the west side of the stadium at BMO being filled. Seeing that east side, especially on TV, is going to, you know, it's going to look good and it's going to sound much better. You know, you know, Luke, I've, I've had, actually had uh, the opportunity to ask Andy Fantuz this question, but I haven't asked you this question. What's it like when you're on the field, the communication aspect, you're trying to get things done, especially on second down when the crowd starts to roar and, and people are hammering on David Mercy, they're hammering on those aluminum seats. Like, is it really that much of a problem? Yeah, it is. There's there's certainly stadiums where uh, you're you're fully uh, uh, full hand signal offense, you know, uh, no, no, no snap count or anything. Uh, the huddle gets tough and you kind of feel the energy out there. It's uh, it, it certainly translates. And um, the the I'll add to this that you get late in the season. Uh, more Suda, you mentioned the, you know, the weather on some of the, where depending on where you are, like if you're going to get a bad weather day, which, of course, can happen anywhere in Canada, but it can happen on, in Toronto, right on Lake Ontario. And it that obviously happens in the plains uh, frequently once we're getting into November here. But you're playing a team like Toronto or Winnipeg when you're on offense and the sound and they're in their their the fans are making such a ruckus like that and then you have to go stand on the cold sidelines against a team with a good run game who controls the clock <laughs> and then so you're just so it's like it's compounding effects right as you get later into the season and especially against those two teams which can run the ball that really make it like like you know there's 7 minutes left in the game and you're like <laughs> 
I wish it was three minutes left in the game. Right? <laughs> I, would, I, I, I wish this would speed up, but we can't. We, I can't even get onto the field to try to make a difference here. This is, uh, you know, that that is a real home field advantage uh, when, with a, for a team who can run. And Luke, what about Montreal and those vuvuzuelas and and the, the horns that they allow them to bring into that stadium? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a pretty good one as well. And the the thing about uh, being an an away team at Montreal, of course, you know they're they're the home locker rooms in the sta- in that same stadium as well, obviously. But you're in a bunker down there, and so you kind of get a sense that you're in enemy territory uh, before the fans have even entered the stadium. And there's some, it's interesting the way that each stadium looks from the field because Montreal sort of it really feels like everyone's on top of you like it like the like they're like they're playing on walls and the mountain of course there with McGill sort of changes everything so it really feels like you're kind of in a well and then the, then the locker room is sort of in a bunker underneath the well and so uh, Montreal is tough too and and I remember we won a game there I think it was in 2014 or 15 and I you know I was somewhat new to the Tie Cats at the time but that was and I we we won and. I was told that was the first time we'd won in Montreal for like 15 years or something like that. <laughs> some some crazy uh, some crazy losing streak in Montreal. It, it's not easy. They they uh, they do a good job there. And David Naylor, I mean you you're, you know you're kind of in my age group too. You can go back to the days of Iverwin Stadium. Uh, and when you talk about fans being on top of you and just the hostility, I mean just to be honest, you can remember those days. Uh, oh my God, Luke, did you play there? Did you play at Iverwin? My first night driving into Hamilton to join the team the next day, I was driving past the skeleton of Tim Hortons Field. So I missed Ivor Wynn by a couple months okay. of having been uh, demoed on my uh, before I came. Yeah, it, it was rustically charming, you might call it. Uh, you know, but you're right. The fans were right <laughs> on top of you, right? There was all kinds of stories of, you know, fans and players exchanging things. Sometimes as players were going down the tunnels at, at various points and, and the other thing was the visitors' locker room, man. <laughs> like I used to walk in there to do interviews and think, "My goodness, man, this place is cramped and sweaty and, frankly, gross." You know, like, it was, it was, you, you had to be you had to be one of the first five people to get into the shower, or it was trouble. My goodness, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah that's it. The Thai cats are living large these days compared to that. <laughs> yeah, we. I was. I was spoiled by the time I got there. Although I did have to go through the Guel- through Jarvis, Guelph, the Jarvis yeah. uh, business facilities, and then Guelph uh, games as well. My favorite Ivor Win uh, story from the guys who had played there was that if, if if someone was sitting on the John, they could see daylight through the stands, <laughs> like from the from the internals of the locker room. There was like daylight making it through cracks in the stands. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, the press box elevator where you know the average temperature on a summer day was about 106 was my favorite it was about you know four feet by four feet by eight feet high <laughs> amazing well i'm sure i'm sure people in you know out in winnipeg with what was that cannon Inn stadium and even taylor field in saskatchewan and regina pardon me that uh, I covered, sure they, they got similar yeah. stories i'm sure oh i covered a playoff game in winnipeg where the roof was leaking in the press box <laughs> okay. All right, guys. We got we got basically four teams left that, that are in this uh, gray up gray cup playoff. We'll start with the East. David Morrisuti uh, again. We talked about it. We got some uh, announcements today. The, the Trues are going to be playing. Uh, attendance is, is is could be set at an all time high for the Toronto Argonauts. All advantages, I'm sure, for the Toronto squad. But uh, do you smell an upset? Can the Montreal Alouettes finally get the job done and represent the East in the Grey Cup? I mean, if they're, their defense play like they did against Hamilton, they sure have a chance. My concern is their offense, right? Can they get you know put up points against this Toronto defense that feasts on turnovers, doesn't like to stay on the field long? I think for Montreal, they got to find a way to get that running game going so that they don't give that Argos offense extra possessions and that's going to be key for them i think like toronto's heavily favored for a reason they've got everything kind of working for them but you know they're they're certainly montreal's played them really tough i think back to that for one of the first meetings that they had against each other in montreal like that was a close game right until the end and the second one of the other matchups austin mack gets uh ejected really early and that changed the whole game i think for montreal because they lost their best offensive weapon so they, they're going to have to, I think, they can't get off to a slow start on offense, right? They're going to have to put up some points because Toronto will 
will feast on any extra possessions, any turnovers that they that they have on offense. Mr. Naylor. You know, sometimes I try to envision how I think a game is going to be won. And here's my vision for the Argos in Montreal. I think the Ar- I think Montreal's offensive line has an enormous task keeping Toronto's defensive front off of Cody Fajardo. And we know he's been prone to take sacks this year. And I, I imagine Cody Fajardo under pressure, running for his life, throwing the ball to Jamal Peters. And and that's that's kind of that's how I that's what I if there's a back breaking play in that game, that's what I imagine. And and I think it really heightens the matchup between Montreal's offensive line and, and Toronto's defensive front. And 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 you know, anytime you're going in as a significant underdog, you know, you can't you can't give up sort of a talent advantage and lose the turnover battle. That's basically a recipe for hundred percent loss. I think we know Toronto's the more talented team, so I, I would say what Cody Fajardo does with the ball under pressure, which he is inevitably going to face, is a is a real key for me in this matchup. Luke, we, we saw we put the, you saw what the the, the, the Alouettes defend Noel Thorpe, their defensive coordinator, what they put together for the Tiger Cats, and you know, can you envision that working for the Toronto against the Toronto uh, offense? Boy, it, it is going to be hard. And the thing that's just so impressive about Toronto is they've got a quarterback in Chad Kelly who's been in the MOP conversation since the start of the season and they've got a running back who's at the absolute top of the league and he just you know Chad Kelly doesn't even have to play perfect to 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 you know be uh, you know to, to to win for sure uh and and he doesn't have to throw for 300 to, to play a very good game it's just a it's a very tough offense to corral uh, so I'm I, my sights are on the Montreal offense for how, how well can they answer back uh, again in Toronto, you know, defensively, they, they've done a great job as well in the turnover ratio, although Montreal finished the season, I think they were plus 14 in the turnover ratio for the regular season. They've done a decent job of protecting the football and taking it away. You you have to do that in the playoffs to win. You have to do it. And and they've they've uh, they've handled their business in that. They certainly that was the key uh, to both the Hamilton losses, the end of the regular season and the uh, and this past semifinal weekend was Hamilton not uh, not doing well in the turnover ratio. And so if Montreal can maybe come out a plus two, a plus three, they may have a chance if they're able to just steal a couple drives back from Toronto uh, and just give themselves a few more chances. Uh, but they're going to have to put points on the board. Uh, uh, I think that for some reason... While Hamilton just could not, Bubba, you and I saw them play uh, Toronto so poorly uh, this year. Montreal hung in there with Toronto. And yeah, it's 0-3 on the regular season. But uh, more so, you you mentioned, I think there was a three-point game to start. And then there was a seven-point game uh, later on in the season as well. So they've had a couple one-score matches. Uh, You know, I I don't think we're in for a a bad game. I think we're going to see some good football. And Montreal's got to start by by doing what they've done, which is protect the ball. I want to ask. Question: Can I jump in and ask Luke a question from a player's perspective? I, I'm curious, Luke, about a very unique situation with Toronto that they have not had to play a meaningful game since mid-September. There it was going. And I know that Ryan kind of he seemed to sort of rethink his philosophy down the stretch, where all of a sudden the 16-win thing became important because he needed something for his guys to shoot for. Right? It was. It went. It was at first he was managing it like preseason, and then he probably thought, "Hold on a second, this is a long, long time. We can't have." you know, yeah. six, or seven games of preseason. So all of a sudden it was like, yep, we're going after 16 wins. But that's different, right? Because when you're playing Ottawa, going for 16 wins and, you know, their season's been over for a month and yours has been over for two months. As a, is My question, I guess, to boil it down is, is it just the nature of football that as a player, you know, with six off days and one on, you're used to flicking the switch and saying, okay, it's go time? Or is this, you know, is, is there a wrinkle in here for Toronto because – the last time it's really been go time for them. I mean, it was not that long past Labor Day. Yeah, uh, my my. There's a caveat to this, but my my answer, what I actually feel is, you you can flick the switch on, and I think specifically with Toronto, if you're a one, if you got your one tool, and you're a team that's got to pass for 450, and you've got to get the ball down the field that way, and that's your only option. 
Well, it only takes one or two guys to have an off day for for the glass castle to shatter. But Toronto, Toronto's got a Toronto's got kind of a lot of answers going, and they're gonna they'll find their way there. They can win games scoring not scoring over twenty, and they can win games scoring more than twenty. It's just I think that you may see some first quarter, and that's the caveat to me. I think sometimes you do just get a little stunned all of a sudden. You kind of, and it almost takes you a play or two or a drive or a quarter to sort of realize kind of what's going on and feel like and, and get back to the feeling of, of how much it matters uh, when you're on the field. Um, maybe it could lead to a slow start, I guess, is my, is my best uh, guess as to the potential negative of such a long stretch of meaningless games. Um, I think you could see that. But it's not going to last. You're not just going to. You're not going to keep a team like Toronto just sort of stunned, you know, all the way through the through the uh, into the second half. Um, and I think also uh, this is, comes down to leadership too. I think you can have uh, just an energy in the locker room and a veteran leadership that sort of just extinguishes that feeling of sort of just you know cobwebs and rust uh, early in the week. Uh, and you could see a team very fresh hit the ground running. And so I th- I think generally a team like Toronto is well equipped to sort of flick the switch back on. You know, David Moore Studio, we're just get, uh, giving the Owls a little bit of props here. You've got to give, I guess, Danny Machocha some credit here. He has added some pieces to their defense. It's almost like, I mean, not like they were bypassing Hamilton because I'm sure they had some confidence about beating Hamilton. It was like they were building a team halfway through the season with some acquisitions to beat the Argos. Oh, I, I do think so, right? You look at Bishop Sankey, like his presence alone. And he even said, we could have played better. <laughs> like to hear, like it's not just the play on the field, but it's also the confidence, right? And the leadership as, as Luke brought, brings up on, right? You need those elements and you need that confidence to say, we, we can go out and beat Toronto, right? But also have the guys that are willing to back up that talk with the play. And I think like Sankey was such a, like, at first I was, I was questioning the decision, just because I wasn't sure how he was going to fit in Montreal's defense. And then he fit quite well against uh, Hamilton in that game. Right. And they're going to need that. Toronto's got so many ways that they can try to beat you and you got to, you know, make life as difficult as possible for Chad Kelly. You got to make sure that they can't get those big run bursts from AJ Ouellette. So they're going to have to rely on all the components of the defense, like Mark Antoine Ducroix, though, like the way that he has built this team, it's you know you commend him because you know they they got off to the ball a little late right trying to figure out what ownership was going to be like and that that kind of impacted guys who left and who they had to replace but they found ways to just plug and play guys into certain spots and they've all kind of come in together to work well and this is why i think toronto is going to have a tough time because this montreal defense can give them those those chances right if toronto gets off to a slow start Maybe maybe Montreal can build a little bit of momentum for themselves and take advantage. I think if you go back to preseason predictions, Bubba, and look, try to find people who predicted Montreal to have a home playoff game. Not many. Everyone and, thought they'd be, they'd be fourth in the East. Yeah, and look, I, they were going through a real tough time. I mean, I, I, back in that offseason, I was talking to Danny Machocha at least once a week, just trying to get a sense of what was going on there. And, and like, you know, I don't think I'm telling stories out of school here. He was pretty stressed. <laughs> like his, his free agent, his quarterback's walking out the door to Saskatchewan. His number one receiver's walking out the door to Edmonton, and because he couldn't give them any answers, you know. And, and those and those were not guys that were looking to get out of Montreal. I talked to Trevor at the end of the year; he fully expected to be back there. Geno Lewis lived year round in Montreal, like he was fully all in in that market for that organization. So they were not guys who were you know going anyway. If if that hadn't happened, and you know they they managed to put it together. Uh, and as you say, made some additions over the course of the year. The Sean Lemon one panned out uh, as as well as could possibly be ima- have imagined. And and I, I, I just give them an overall measure of credit for you know having gone through a very very tough off season with so much uncertainty and and managed to make it come together on the field pretty well. West final, West final. Your thoughts, Luke? This, I mean, in the regular season, these. Three matchups, if I can remember, especially the one where BC went right into Winnipeg. Like, what's going to happen here? This, 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 I got all kinds of question marks here. Yeah, I do too. This is the most exciting game of the playoffs, uh, short of the Grey Cup. Of these four games in semifinal and final week, BC and Winnipeg uh, 
that's a great matchup. We saw interesting uh, wins and losses throughout the regular season. Uh, and I mean, we may see a hundred points scored. I don't know. Like you just don't know what these teams are going to do. If, if Vernon Adams throws the ball and, and gets and moves the chains like he did, uh, this is going to, we may have an awesome shootout. Uh, Winnipeg's defense though, you know, VA does have to play his best almost. You feel like, you know, and, and that's just what you're saying about Chad Kelly. I, the thing that, the thing that's been so hard about, uh, about Toronto, so difficult to play against them is that you don't have to have Chad Kelly even to be perfect or even outstanding or even with a spectacular, uh, uh, stat line in any way. And they'll, and they win. I think that you need BC's offense to have a pretty spectacular game, uh, to, to win in Winnipeg. Uh, but it, this is the game I'm most looking forward to. Uh, if I had to, uh, to put a prediction down, I do think Winnipeg with their run game at home, um, and, a, and, a, and the way that their defense plays, obviously Zach Caleros doing what he's been doing all season. Uh, I think, I, I think they're the team and, and I would pick them. Uh, but I'm excited to watch what BC will do. David Morrissey, about a year ago, or maybe, and I'll extend it to a couple of years ago, I would have had bombers slam dunk. I will say this, and you might not agree. I feel like we at Winnipeg at times this year have looked a little leaky, if if that's fair to say. Yeah, this is not the same Winnipeg team that dominated, you know, a few years ago. Even like they've they've lost games in Winnipeg, right? There was a time where you couldn't even think about winning a game in Winnipeg, and like that that theory has kind of been debunked a little bit, you know. Have they also played? Like I remember that the people say, "Oh, they got blown out." The BC got blown out in Winnipeg. Well, Vernon Adams wasn't playing in that game. That was Dane Evans, right? So they're going to have probably the best version of Vernon Adams in this game. All their weapons are like they're not dealing with any major injuries there, so they're going to get a full healthy BC offense that they're going to have to figure out. You know, one of the big statement victories BC had early in the year was against Winnipeg, right? But it wasn't just the offense. We talk a lot about the BC offense. How about the BC defense, right? That was the big big calling mark of that victory was how they made Zach Laros' life miserable. And that's, I think, going to have to be key for them. They're gonna have, that defense is going to have to put pressure on Caleros. Yeah, Brady Oliveira, you can hand the ball off to him. If B, but BC, with the way their offense is going, they're going to have to make... Winnipeg beat them through the air, which they obviously can. Zach Lewis is very much capable of doing it, but I think BC is going to have to make life miserable for him. That pass rush is going to have to keep him in that pocket as much as possible. You know, Dave, Dave Naylor, we, we, talk, we always talk about the Winnipeg pass rush, and they still may be the statement in this game. But, yes, David Morissuti brings up the great fact. In that game in Winnipeg, Zach Calero sacked, I believe, eight times. Uh, Betts, we really – it was an introduction to Matthew Betts for many of us. If that happens, it could be trouble. Yeah, that's the worst I've seen Winnipeg's offensive line look. I mean, by far. you Just overwhelmed is not an expression you use to describe the way they look on, on any given night. And look, I, This is an intriguing matchup because you've got one blow up, blowout each way. And then you've got a game where, you know, if Dominic Rimes falls down with three seconds left and they kick the field goal, <laughs> this is Vancouver this weekend, right? That's that's the difference between them in the, in the third game. So we, we know that both teams are capable of, of you know, putting up big performances and shocking the other. But I, I think we all feel like there's probably a greater likelihood we're going to see a game like the one we saw a few weeks ago in BC when, you know, they are basically playing for the division title. It basically was a, a playoff game. So I think home field in Winnipeg is different than home field in BC uh, just because of the, the, the nature of the crowd. They aren't going to have any empty seats and the, the weather and the bombers and all that. But, uh, well, I, I expect a good one. I, and like Luke said, I think this could be a real offensive showcase. With it, Despite the fact that both teams have really good defenses, it, I, it's certainly possible this could be a shootout. Well, we certainly look forward to an amazing game, which I think is going to be a tremendous West Final, East Final. Uh, and then it all boils down in a couple of weeks, less than two weeks, folks, before they they all come to Hamilton for the Grey Cup. And we're thinking that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful matchup. David Naylor, when people want to find you, as always, we appreciate you joining in with us. But if people want to talk some football with you on social media, where can they find you? At TSN Dave Naylor. At TSN Dave Naylor. David Moore, Sudi. You can find me on the X platform at D underscore Moore Sudi. Two S's, two T's. 
Yeah, and Luke, I, I guess, and actually, I do know this for a fact. Luke is one of like the Dwayne Fords of the world that refuses to be on social media because, as in their words, it's a cesspool, right? So we know we can't <laughs> certainly find Luke anywhere. Uh, Luke, but you, you can't you can you can email me at Ticats Audio Network at the game day at ticats.ca oh, and we oh. uh we do get uh we have a lot of fan interaction for the Coach O show. So maybe for uh for future episodes of the Coach O show you can certainly get a hold of me there. Okay, because I know I, I I knew you were alongside like, Dwayne Ford. The Dwayne is uh, the yes. anti <laughs> anti X or anti Twitter, whatever you want to call it nowadays. So <laughs> once every year and a half he pumps one out. <laughs> and, and just quickly there, Dave Nelly, you're you're off. What, what's your next assignment? I mean, you've been you've been putting in some outstanding mileage and putting in and producing some great work for uh, us on TSN. Well, it, it's great because you know TSN has just made such a great commitment to the sport of football in general. And actually, uh, not long after we end this uh, broadcast, I'm I'm heading down to uh, to Luke's uh, hometown of Buffalo, New York. Be at the uh, UB game tonight, Ohio. At Buffalo, you can uh, the top two prospects of the CFL uh, fall prospect list are both in this game, and of course Curtis Rourke being the one that's going to grab the most attention. Uh, it's at seven thirty, and you can watch it on TSN one, four, and five. And I will be pre and post game on Sports Center. And can you let us know about the second prospect? Oh, uh, Wallace, the offensive lineman at Buffalo. His first name uh, escapes me right now. He's a kid from Salmon Arm, BC, okay. and. Uh, you got a, you got an offensive lineman in this game and a quarterback who are both likely to hear their names very early uh, next year in the CFL draft. Of course, unless that other league calling on either of them. There you go, Luke. Western New York, maybe the next pipeline for the Canadian Football League. <laughs> very hey, cool. Guy, That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's always been a pleasure, folks. Uh, again, we certainly appreciate putting together this broadcast for you. Yes, the Thai Cats are up, but we'll be taking this right till after the conclusion on the CFL this week to after the Great Cup is handed out. Uh, again, catch us each week on the Thai Cats Audio Network or wherever you catch your podcast. And as we always ask, please like and subscribe. We certainly appreciate those five-star ratings. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.